Go. First topic on the table. Padres fight for first place continues. Now, I said two and a half, three weeks ago, and Riley will back me up. The next 15 games they play will put them in the pennant race or will bury them. And, of course, the 15 are against the Rockies, the Marlins, the Pirates, and they got hot, and they drove a stake into the pennant race. They got within two games. Now they've given some ground. Now they're four and a half back as they go back out on the road against St. Louis. This is a team, I think it's almost a team of destiny. Topic one, question one, A.J. Preller. As relentless as he has been getting players, how he's gotten players, what he's paid the players he's acquired, this might be his best work ever as he goes into his 10th year as general manager of the Padres. Give me your thoughts on what Preller was, what Preller does, how he conducts his business, and what Preller's put on the field this season. Well, I think uh, as far as the way he's conducted his business this year, uh, I think he knew uh, going into this year he had a lot of heat on him. His contract is up after the 2026 season. He needed to win, even though they cut back the payroll. Uh, every move that he has made. I mean, I, I don't care. You want to talk Dylan C. You want to talk uh, trading Soto. All those guys have come back and helped in one uh, way or another. You oh, know, the what, bench bunch. The bench bunch. Uh, Solano, David Peralta, a guy that I've always liked. I mean, uh, you know, he was kind of on uh, life support there on a minor league contract with the Cubs, got released. Padres give him an opportunity. He's made the most of it. It's been a really exciting year, and I think this is probably the best uh, he's done. But again, uh, right now it looks like they're headed to the playoffs. But you know what are they going to do uh, in the playoffs? But hey, the, the big thing, Lee, trading deadlines come and gone. But they get Joe Musgrove back, and now pretty good uh, workout yesterday by you Darvish at the ballpark. We'll see what he brings to the table when they activate him. Next topic. Is there an intangible that we can point to with manager Mike Schilt that has made the team different, made the clubhouse different, make the roster respond to him? Is it what he did in St. Louis, his transfer to San Diego, your impression of the Padres' first-year manager? I think he's done a good job. I think sometimes uh, maybe a little bit too uh, brown and gold uh, glasses on. Uh, you know, I think he's very thin-skinned. Uh, you know, he's had a, a good run this year, no doubt about it. But there have been some questions, whether you like the questions or not. Uh, I think he's a little uh, little touchy at times. Uh, there are certain things that he said during the year. I could see where, you know, St. Louis probably. I, I, I can see now, even though I think he's done a really good job, I, I can see why a baseball town like St. Louis, even though he was winning there, decided to go a different direction. Uh, but you know what? The players are playing their tail off for him. They don't give up at bats. They're putting the ball in play. I think he's done a great job. I think the one area where I think sometimes he struggles a little bit is dealing with the pitching staff, and that's a real art. And, again, he's getting to know a lot of these guys, but at this point in time, I think you know he should have a pretty good idea. I do think this. I, uh, Sunday's game when Martin Perez uh, gave up that home run and then walked three in a row. I think a lot of managers Lee, may have let him, uh, you know, being a veteran pitcher, may have tried to see if he could get out of that inning. But Mike Schultz was not only managing that game, he was managing his bullpen, knowing what they not not going to have any days off. But he's also looking at the scoreboard. Arizona had already won. The Dodgers were in a dogfight up there against Tampa. And uh, he made the right move, I think, on Sunday. Rosters. Who could have seen this? Ted Williams was the original kid in San Diego, what he became at Fenway Park with the Red Sox. This is the kid 2-0. What Jackson Merrill has become to me is absolutely stunning at age 21, not only handling it, bouncing back from 0 for 20 slumps and not letting them mentally fall apart. This is a special 21-year-old they got in center field, by the way, a new position. I don't think all the years I've been here and you have a few more cups of coffee than I have. I don't think there's been an exciting rookie in this town since maybe Benito Santiago thoughts on the center fielder, the kid. Uh, I think every day Lee, he amazes a little bit more. I mean, just to be able to play major league center field, let alone doing what he's doing offensively. I mean, I would have been happy if he'd hit 250 and hit, you know, 10 to 12 home mm -hmm. runs this year and drove in, you know, 40 or 50 runs would have been a fantastic year. But this kid, he likes the big moment. He knows how to deal with it. I think that the veterans have taken a liking to him. Uh, and the thing that I like when he gets interviewed after games, it's not about him. It's about team and we got to win ball games. And uh, this kid played Lee 46 
double A game. He never played in triple A. And what he's doing right now is really a miracle. And I'm so happy for him because he seems to be just a great kid, works hard every day, and he's able to turn the page. Where a lot of young guys, they beat themselves up when they go 0 for 12 or 0 for 16. They have a hard time, you know, looking people in the eye. This guy comes back thinking he's going to go 4 for 4 the next day. Manny Machado, third baseman. I think the game comes very easy to him. Sometimes it looks like he's loafing, <laughs> blowing bubble gums, not running out ground balls. He's haunted by what he did in Baltimore. He's probably going to be haunted forever by his statement, I'm not Johnny Hustle, that he made at the end of the his short stay with the Dodgers. But he seems to be a different player and maybe a different person. I don't know if fatherhood's got something to do with that maturity. I don't know whether it's the interaction with the late Peter seidler has got something to do with He's different. At least he appears different to me. You tell me what you see. Uh, I see a, a guy right now that is, uh, he likes to be the alpha. He likes to be the man. And last year you had Tatis uh, coming back last year. You know, he was playing. You had Juan Soto, who definitely wanted to be the man who commanded a lot of attention uh, on the field, off the field, in the clubhouse. Uh, I'll be honest with you. I think addition by subtraction. I, I think getting Soto out of that clubhouse probably played a big part in how this thing has gotten turned around. There's no doubt who the leader of this ball club is, and it's Manny Machado. And I think Machado likes it that way. I think he's flourishing. I don't know how bad he was really hurt early in the year. They want to say because he got off to a slow start because of the shoulder. But let's face it, Manny Machado, aside from the 2022 season, has normally gotten off to a slow start, but now he's really heating up. And, Lee, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, sometimes the game almost comes too easy. Here's a kid that broke into the big leagues at 19 years of age and has had, he's going to the Hall of Fame someday. I don't think <laughs> anybody will argue that, but I do think the game uh, comes a little bit easy for him at times. And I think a lot of fans, uh, they, they get a little frustrated with him, but I got news for you. Watch all the games that I watch night in and night out. There are a lot of guys that don't exactly uh, bust it down the line on routine ground ball outs these days. Fernando Tatis, uh, I don't know if there's a maturity issue there or he is who he's always going to be. Is he injury prone on top of everything else? Well, I'd have to say to this point in time of his career, yes. The thing that's troubling to me, you go back to his rookie year. Remember how he had to miss the last part of his rookie year because he had that stress reaction in his back? Now he's got a stress reaction in his femur. What's going on there? And I also think it's been very, very quiet. I know, you know, he took batting practice the other night out there. He's been doing running and throwing, but there doesn't seem like there's been a whole lot of sense of urgency from Tatis or from the Padres really talking about, you know, what they're going to do with this guy. Well, the doctors, I think, have put a hold on it. They don't want the stress reaction to come back or grow because that would then lose him for the rest of the season. Last topic on Padre baseball, clubhouse chemistry toxic last year. Huh. I've thought long and hard about this. Was it Preller's interference with Melvin? Was it the players tuning out Melvin because they had Preller's backing? Or was it just some bad people in the clubhouse? It sure seems different since there is no Soto, Mr. Me, Myself, and I, and there's no Josh Hader. Uh, I would say all the above. I think anytime the manager gets devalued and the players see that the manager's legs have been cut off, it's hard for the manager to, you know, really uh, demand that respect. And I, I think those guys were button heads. I was one, I was surprised Bob Melvin came back for his second year. I thought even though they got to the NLCS, I had heard there were all kinds of problems and Bob was thinking about not coming back. But I, I know this because Bob Melvin told me uh, he wanted to come back this year. He wanted uh, to come back, but at the end of the day, uh, AJ didn't want to have him back. And luckily for Bob, you know, he was able to stay in the game because that job with the Giants opened up. But I think all of the above. I mean, Soto drained that clubhouse. Hader was selfish. And, and to a certain degree, I understand where Hader was coming from, but I don't agree with it. Uh, you know, he got his money now and, and more power to him. But uh, uh, again, I think there were a lot of factors. Uh, I think the, the manager and the, the, uh, uh, general manager button heads that that played a part in, but I think soda was a real problem more than anybody wanted to admit to. Okay. We do something special on our podcast. When we are done, we give you the fans, the opportunity to join us. It's called fans forum. Jump into the chat box. If you got questions or comments on what I said, what coach John Cantera said, fans forum box is open for you right now. They're stacking up like the planes at Lindbergh Field getting ready to take off. 
Join us now if you got comments to what we've talked about with Padre Baseball.